Chapter Six of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Two, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar. Of course. I shall not pretend to consider it any matter for wonder that the extraordinary case of Monsieur Valdemar has excited discussion. It would have been a miracle had it not, especially under the circumstances. Through the desire of all parties concerned to keep the affair from the public, at least for the present, or until we had farther opportunities for investigation, through our endeavours to effect this, a garbled or exaggerated account made its way into society and became the source of many unpleasant misrepresentations, and, very naturally, of a great deal of disbelief. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts, as far as I comprehend them myself. They are, succinctly, these. My attention for the last three years had been repeatedly drawn to the subject of mesmerism, and about nine months ago it occurred to me quite suddenly that in the series of experiments made hitherto there had been a very remarkable and most unaccountable omission. No person had as yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis. It remained to be seen, first, whether in such condition there existed in the patient any susceptibility to the magnetic influence, secondly, whether, if any existed, it was impaired or increased by the condition thirdly to what extent or for how long a period the encroachments of death might be arrested by the process there were other points to be ascertained but these most excited my curiosity the last in especial from the immensely important character of its consequences in looking around me for some subject by whose means i might test these particulars i was brought to think of my friend monsieur ernest valdemar the well-known compiler of the bibliotheca forensica and author under the nom de plume of isaacar marx of the polish versions of wallenstein and gargantua monsieur valdemar who has resided principally at Harlem, New York, since the year 1839, is, or was, particularly noticeable for the extreme spareness of his person, his lower limbs much resembling those of John Randolph, and also for the whiteness of his whiskers, in violent contrast to the blackness of his hair, the latter, in consequence, being very generally mistaken for a wig. His temperament was markedly nervous, and rendered him a good subject for mesmeric experiment. On two or three occasions I had put him to sleep with little difficulty, but was disappointed in other results, which his peculiar constitution had naturally led me to anticipate. His will was at no period positively or thoroughly under my control, and in regard to clairvoyance, I could accomplish with him nothing to be relied upon. I always attributed my failure at these points to the disordered state of his health. For some months previous to my becoming acquainted with him, his physicians had declared him in a confirmed thesis. It was his custom, indeed, to speak calmly of his approaching dissolution, as of a matter neither to be avoided nor regretted. When the ideas to which I have alluded first occurred to me, it was, of course, very natural that I should think of Monsieur Valdemar. I knew the steady philosophy of the man too well to apprehend any scruples from him, and he had no relatives in America who would be likely to interfere. I spoke to him frankly upon the subject, and, to my surprise, his interest seemed vividly excited. I say to my surprise, 
for although he had always yielded his person freely to my experiments, he had never before given me any tokens of sympathy with what I did. His disease was of that character which would admit of exact calculation in respect to the epoch of its termination in death and it was finally arranged between us that he would send for me about twenty-four hours before the period announced by his physicians as that of his decease it is now rather more than seven months since i received from m valdemar himself the subjoined note my dear p you may as well come now d and f are agreed that I cannot hold out beyond tomorrow midnight, and I think they have hit the time very nearly. Valdemar. I received this note within half an hour after it was written, and in fifteen minutes more I was in the dying man's chamber. I had not seen him for ten days, and was appalled by the fearful alteration which the brief interval had wrought in him. His face wore a leaden hue, the eyes were utterly lustreless, and the emaciation was so extreme that the skin had been broken through by the cheekbone. His expectoration was excessive, the pulse was barely perceptible, he retained, nevertheless, in a very remarkable manner, both his mental power and a certain degree of physical strength. He spoke with distinctness, took some palliative medicines without aid, and when I entered the room, was occupied in pencilling memoranda in a pocket-book. He was propped up in the bed by pillows. Doctors D and F were in attendance. After pressing Valdemar's hand, I took these gentlemen aside, and obtained from them a minute account of the patient's condition the left lung had been for eighteen months in a semi-osseous or cartilaginous state and was of course entirely useless for all purposes of vitality the right in its upper portion was also partially if not thoroughly ossified while the lower region was merely a mass of purulent tubercles running one into another several extensive perforations existed and at one point permanent adhesion to the ribs had taken place these appearances in the right lobe were of comparatively recent date the ossification had proceeded with very unusual rapidity no sign of it had been discovered a month before and the adhesion had only been observed during the three previous days independently of the thysis the patient was suspected of aneurysm of the iota but on this point the osseous symptoms rendered an exact diagnosis impossible it was the opinion of both physicians that monsieur valdemar would die about midnight on the morrow sunday it was then seven o'clock on saturday evening on quitting the invalid's bedside to hold conversation with myself doctors d and f had bidden him a final farewell it had not been their intention to return but at my request they agreed to look in upon the patient about ten the next night when they had gone i spoke freely with monsieur valdemar on the subject of his approaching dissolution as well as, more particularly, of the experiment proposed. He still professed himself quite willing, and even anxious to have it made, and urged me to commence it at once. A male and a female nurse were in attendance, but I did not feel myself altogether at liberty to engage in the task of this character with no more reliable witnesses than these people, in case of sudden accident, might prove. I therefore postponed operations until about eight the next night, when the arrival of a medical student with whom I had some acquaintance, a Mr. Theodore L., relieved me from farther embarrassment. 
it had been my design originally to wait for the positions but i was induced to proceed first by the urgent entreaties of monsieur valdemar and secondly by my conviction that i had not a moment to lose as he was evidently sinking fast mr l was so kind as to accede to my desire that he would take notes of all that occurred and it is from his memoranda that what i now have to relate is for the most part either condensed or copied verbatim it wanted about five minutes of eight when taking the patient's hand i begged him to state as distinctly as he could to mr l whether he monsieur valdemar was entirely willing that i should make the experiment of mesmerizing him in his then condition he replied feebly yet quite audibly yes i wish to be i fear you have mesmerized adding immediately afterwards deferred it too long while he spoke thus i commenced the passes which i had already found most effectual in subduing him he was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead but although i exerted all my powers no further perceptible effect was induced until some minutes after ten o'clock when doctors d and f called according to appointment i explained to them in a few words what i designed and as they opposed no objection saying that the patient was already in the death agony i proceeded without hesitation exchanging however the lateral passes for downward ones and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer by this time his pulse was imperceptible and his breathing was stertorous and at intervals of half a minute this condition was nearly unaltered for a quarter of an hour at the expiration of this period however a natural although a very deep sigh escaped the bosom of the dying man and the stertorous breathing ceased that is to say its stertorousness was no longer apparent the intervals were undiminished the patient's extremities were of an icy coldness at five minutes before eleven i perceived unequivocal signs of the mesmeric influence the glassy roll of the eye was changed for that expression of uneasy inward examination which is never seen except in cases of sleep-waking and which it is quite impossible to mistake with a few rapid lateral passes I made the lids quiver, as in incipient sleep, and with a few more I closed them altogether. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously, and with the fullest exertion of the will, until I had completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer, after placing them in a seemingly easy position the legs were at full length the arms were nearly so and reposed on the bed at a moderate distance from the loin the head was very slightly elevated when i had accomplished this it was fully midnight and i requested the gentleman present to examine monsieur valdemar's condition after a few experiments they admitted him to be an unusually perfect state of mesmeric trance the curiosity of both the physicians was greatly excited dr d resolved at once to remain with the patient all night while dr f took leave with a promise to return at daybreak mr l and the nurses remained we left monsieur valdemar entirely undisturbed until about three o'clock in the morning when i approached him and found him in precisely the same condition 
as when dr f went away that is to say he lay in the same position the pulse was imperceptible the breathing was gentle scarcely noticeable unless through the application of a mirror to the lips the eyes were closed naturally and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble still the general appearance was certainly not that of death as i approached monsieur valdemar i made a kind of half effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own as i passed the latter gently to and fro above his person in such experiments with this patient i had never perfectly succeeded before and assuredly i had little thought of succeeding now but to my astonishment his arm very readily although feebly followed every direction i assigned it with mine i determined to hazard a few words of conversation monsieur valdemar i said are you asleep he made no answer but i perceived a tremor about the lips and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again at its third repetition his whole frame was agitated by a very slight shivering the eyelids unclosed themselves so far as to display a white line of the ball the lips moved sluggishly and from between them in a barely audible whisper issued the words yes asleep now do not wake me let me die so i here felt the limbs and found them as rigid as ever the right arm as before obeyed the direction of my hand i questioned the sleep waker again do you still feel pain in the breast monsieur valdemar the answer now was immediate but even less audible than before no pain i'm dying i did not think it advisable to disturb him further just then and nothing more was said or done until the arrival of dr f who came a little before sunrise and expressed unbounded astonishment at finding the patient still alive after feeling the pulse and applying a mirror to the lips he requested me to speak to the sleep-waker again i did so saying monsieur valdemar do you still sleep as before some minutes elapsed ere a reply was made and during the interval the dying man seemed to be collecting his energies to speak at my fourth repetition of the question he said very faintly almost inaudibly yes still asleep dying it was now the opinion or rather the wish of the physicians that monsieur valdemar should be suffered to remain undisturbed in his present apparently tranquil condition until death should supervene and this it was generally agreed must now take place within a few minutes i concluded however to speak to him once more and merely repeated my previous question while i spoke there came a marked change over the countenance of the sleep-waker the eyes rolled themselves slowly open the pupils disappearing upwardly the skin generally assumed a cadaverous hue resembling not so much parchment as white paper and the circular hectic spots which hitherto had been strongly defined in the centre of each cheek went out at once i use this expression because the suddenness of their departure put me in mind of nothing so much as the extinguishment of a candle by a puff of the breath the upper lip at the same time writhed itself away from the teeth which it had previously covered completely while the lower jaw fell with an audible jerk leaving the mouth widely extended and disclosing in full view 
the swollen and blackened tongue i presume that no member of the party then present had been unaccustomed to deathbed horrors but so hideous beyond conception was the appearance of monsieur valdemar at this moment that there was a general shrinking back from the region of the bed i now feel that i have reached a point of this narrative at which every reader will be startled into positive disbelief it is my business however simply to proceed there was no longer the faintest sign of vitality in monsieur valdemar and concluding him to be dead we were consigning him to the charge of the nurses when a strong vibratory motion was observable in the tongue this continued for perhaps a minute at the expiration of this period there issued from the distended and motionless jaws a voice such as it would be madness in me to attempt describing there are indeed two or three epithets which might be considered as applicable to it in part i might say for example that the sound was harsh and broken and hollow but the hideous whole is indescribable for the simple reason that no similar sounds have ever jarred upon the ear of humanity there were two particulars nevertheless which i thought then and still think might fairly be stated as characteristic of the intonation as well adapted to convey some idea of its unearthly peculiarity in the first place the voice seemed to reach our ears at least mine from a vast distance or from some deep cavern within the earth in the second place it impressed me i fear indeed that it will be impossible to make myself comprehended as gelatinous or glutinous matters impress the sense of touch i have spoken both of sound and of voice i mean to say that the sound was one of distinct of even wonderfully thrillingly distinct syllabification monsieur valdemar spoke obviously in reply to the question i had propounded to him a few minutes before i had asked him it will be remembered if he still slept he now said yes no i have been sleeping and now now i no person present even affected to deny or attempted to repress the unutterable shuddering horror which these few words thus uttered were so well calculated to convey mr l the student swooned the nurses immediately left the chamber and could not be induced to return my own impressions i would not pretend to render intelligible to the reader for nearly an hour we busied ourselves silently without the utterance of a word in endeavours to revive mr l when he came to himself we addressed ourselves again to an investigation of m valdemar's condition it remained in all respects as i have last described it with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration an attempt to draw blood from the arm failed i should mention too that this limb was no farther subject to my will i endeavoured in vain to make it follow the direction of my hand the only real indication indeed of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory movement of the tongue whenever i addressed m valdemar a question he seemed to be making an effort to reply but had no longer sufficient volition 
to queries put to him by any other person than myself he seemed utterly insensible although i endeavoured to place each member of the company in mesmeric rapport with him i believe that i have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleep-waker state at this epoch other nurses were procured and at ten o'clock i left the house in company with the two physicians and mr l in the afternoon we all called again to see the patient his condition remained precisely the same we had now some discussion as to the propriety and feasibility of awakening him but we had little difficulty in agreeing that no good purpose would be served by so doing it was evident that so far death or what is usually termed death had been arrested by the mesmeric process it seemed clear to us all that to awaken m valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant or at least his speedy dissolution from this period until the close of last week an interval of nearly seven months we continued to make daily calls at m valdemar's house accompanied now and then by medical and other friends all this time the sleep waker remained exactly as i have last described him the nurse's attentions were continual it was on friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him and it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles to so much of what i cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling for the purpose of relieving m valdemar from the mesmeric trance i made use of the customary passes these for a time were unsuccessful the first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris it was observed as especially remarkable that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outpouring of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids of a pungent and highly offensive odour it was now suggested that i should attempt to influence the patient's arm as heretofore i made the attempt and failed dr f then intimated a desire to have me put a question i did so as follows monsieur valdemar can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now there was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks the tongue quivered or rather rolled violently in the mouth although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before and at length the same hideous voice which i have already described broke forth for god's sake quick, quick. put me to sleep Oh, quick. Waken me, quick. I say to you that I am dead. I was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an endeavour to recompose the patient, but failing in this through total abeyance of the will i retraced my steps and as earnestly struggled to awake him in this attempt i soon saw that i should be successful or at least i soon fancied that my success would be complete and i am sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken for what really occurred however it is quite impossible that any human being could have been prepared as I rapidly made the mesmeric passes amid ejaculations of dead, dead, absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer, his whole frame at once within the space of a single minute or even less shrunk, crumbled, absolutely rotted away beneath my hands. Upon the bed, before that whole company, there lay 
a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putridity. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A recording by Tony Addison. The Black Cat. For the most wild, yet most homely narrative, which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad, indeed, would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence, yet mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But to-morrow I die, and to-day I would unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Varrock. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable there is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man i married early and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black, and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise not that she was ever serious upon this point and i mention the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens just now to be remembered pluto this was the cat's name 
was my favourite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the street. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend in temperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew day by day more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retain sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I make no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when, by accident or through affection, they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto, who was now becoming old, and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin-nurtured, thrilled every fibre of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder, while I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty, but it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess, and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philosophy takes no account. Yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man, who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not. Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law, merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself 
to offer violence to its own nature to do wrong for the wrong's sake only that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury i had inflicted upon the unoffending brute one morning in cool blood i slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart hung it because i knew that it had loved me and because i felt it had given me no reason of offence hung it because i knew that in so doing i was committing a sin a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it if such a thing were possible even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible god on the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done i was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire the curtains of my bed were in flames the whole house was blazing it was with great difficulty that my wife a servant and myself made our escape from the conflagration the destruction was complete my entire worldly wealth was swallowed up and i resigned myself thenceforward to despair i am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity but i am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect on the day succeeding the fire i visited the ruins the walls with one exception had fallen in this exception was found in a compartment wall not very thick which stood about the middle of the house and against which had rested the head of my bed the plastering had here in great measure resisted the action of the fire a fact which i attributed to its having been recently spread about this wall a dense crowd were collected and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention the words strange singular and other similar expressions excited my curiosity i approached and saw as if graven in bas relief upon the white surface the figure of a gigantic cat the impression was given with an accuracy truly marvellous there was a rope about the animal's neck when i first beheld this apparition for i could scarcely regard it as less my wonder and my terror were extreme but at length reflection came to my aid the cat i remembered had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house upon the alarm of fire this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd by some one of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber this had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep the falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster the lime of which with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass had then accomplished the portraiture as i saw it although i thus readily accounted to my reason if not altogether to my conscience for the startling fact just detailed it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy for months i could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat and during this period there came back into my spirit a half sentiment that seemed but was not remorse i went so far as to regret the loss of the animal and to look about me among the vile haunts which i now habitually frequented for another pet of the same species and of somewhat similar appearance with which to supply its place one night as i sat half stupefied in a den of more than infamy 
my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment i had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes and what now caused me surprise was the fact that i had not sooner perceived the object thereupon i approached it and touched it with my hand it was a black cat a very large one fully as large as pluto and closely resembling him in every respect but one pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body but this cat had a large although indefinite splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast upon my touching him he immediately arose purred loudly rubbed against my hand and appeared delighted with my notice this then was the very creature of which i was in search i at once offered to purchase it of the landlord but this person made no claim to it knew nothing of it had never seen it before i continued my caresses and when i prepared to go home the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me i permitted it to do so occasionally stooping and patting it as i proceeded when it reached the house it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favourite with my wife for my own part i soon found a dislike to it arising within me this was just the reverse of what i had anticipated but i know not how or why it was its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed by slow degrees these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred i avoided the creature a certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it i did not for some weeks strike or otherwise violently ill-use it but gradually very gradually i came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence what added no doubt to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after i brought it home that like pluto it also had been deprived of one of its eyes this circumstance however only endeared it to my wife who as i have already said possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures with my aversion to this cat however its partiality for myself seemed to increase it followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend whenever i sat it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees covering me with its loathsome caresses if i arose to walk it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down or fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress clamber in this manner to my breast at such times although i longed to destroy it with a blow i was yet withheld from so doing partly by a memory of my former crime but chiefly let me confess it at once by absolute dread of the beast this dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil and yet i should be at a loss how otherwise to define it i am almost ashamed to own yes even in this felon's cell i am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which this animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive my wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair 
of which i have spoken and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one i had destroyed the reader will remember that this mark although large had been originally very indefinite but by slow degrees degrees nearly imperceptible and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline it was now the representation of an object that i shudder to name and for this above all i loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had i dared it was now i say the image of a hideous of a ghastly thing of the gallows oh mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime of agony and of death and now was i indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity and a brute beast whose fellow i had contemptuously destroyed a brute beast to work out for me for me a man fashioned in the image of the high god so much of insufferable woe alas neither by day nor by night knew i the blessing of rest any more during the former the creature left me no moment alone and in the latter i started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight an incarnate nightmare that i had no power to shake off incumbent eternally upon my heart beneath the pressure of torments such as these the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed evil thoughts became my sole intimates the darkest and most evil of thoughts the moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind while from the sudden frequent and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which i now blindly abandoned myself my uncomplaining wife alas was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers one day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit the cat followed me down the steep stairs and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand i aimed a blow at the animal which of course would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as i wished but this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal i withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain she fell dead upon the spot without a groan this hideous murder accomplished i set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body i knew that i could not remove it from the house either by day or by night without the risk of being observed by the neighbours many projects entered my mind at one period i thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire at another i resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar again i deliberated about casting it in the well in the yard about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements and so getting a porter to take it from the house finally i hit upon what i considered a far better expedient than either of these i determined to wall it up in the cellar as the monks of the middle ages are recorded to have walled up their victims for a purpose such as this 
the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed, and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster, which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection, caused by a false chimney or fireplace, that had been filled up and made to resemble the red of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before, so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while, with little trouble, I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here, at least then, my labour has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had, at length, finally resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and the third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. The monster, in terror, had fled the premises for ever. I should behold it no more. All my happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came, very unexpectedly, into the house, and proceeded again to make a rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly, as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom, and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied, and prepared to depart. The glee of my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last, as the party ascended the steps. 
I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. Oh, by the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane which I held in my hand upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the archfiend. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony, and of the demons that exult in the damnation. Of my own thoughts it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless through extremity of terror and of awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth, and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder, and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. End of chapter 7